Good morning. I'm Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Please join me to open this session with prayer. God and Father of us all, in Jesus, thy Son and our Savior, thou hast made us thy sons and daughters in the family of the Church. May thy grace and love help our families in every part of the world. Be united to one another in fidelity to the gospel. May the example of the Holy Family, with the aid of thy Holy Spirit, guide all families, especially those most troubled, to be homes of faith and prayer, always seeking to do thy will and to live in thy love. Through Christ our Lord, amen. It was really challenged two years ago. I wasn't working due to a mishap in a contract and I couldn't complete it. My wife's hand was broke. There was no money coming in, nothing. We were really at a very low place and there was times that I felt like giving up and he wouldn't let me give up. He said, no, honey, no, we're not gonna give up. During that time, is when the marriage became stronger than I ever thought it would be. And she pulled me out of it. She pulled me out of hell. Only way I could see us coming out of that was through God and our strength in one another. One of the beautiful things about God is that he is fundamentally community, that he is three in one and it is fundamental to our understanding of Christianity. It's what works in human society, that we function as a community. The beauty of Bruce and Delicia is that it's real. It's not some idealized nonsense. In fact, there are kids from all over the neighborhood that are virtually being adopted by Bruce and Delicia because the children know what it's supposed to be. It's almost intuitively obvious to them, and they just want to be blessed. Como es la familia, así es la humanidad, porque así es la persona. Cada ser humano se forja y se rehace día a día en la familia, y así hecho y rehecho sale al mundo para hacer el mundo más humano. My family is the world to me. No one can come between my family and I. We are not a perfect family. We fight, we argue, we stop talking to each other for a while, but then when we see each other, it doesn't matter. I see my parents' love and it's awesome. Like, they love each other unconditionally no matter what they're going through. Almost all of my friends' families have gotten divorced. The thing that I try to tell them so they'll understand a little bit about me is that we are your family too. Because if you're close to me, you are family. Families are a source of strength. Families are God's way. So whatever is happening right now, in the end, because it's how we're designed to operate, families are going to re-emerge. His Eminence, Robert Cardinal Sara, was the president of the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, 
the dicastery of the Holy See for the realization of the charitable intentions of the Holy Father. At the age of 34, St. John Paul II confirmed his appointment as our Bishop of Conakry on August 13, 1979. He served as the President of the Bishops' Conference of Guinea and President of the Bishops' Conference of Francophone West Africa. He was head of the Catholic Bible Federation of Africa in Madagascar. In October 2001, he was appointed secretary of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. Since last November, he was appointed prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments. Let us welcome His Eminence, Robert Cardinal Sara. Brothers and sisters in Christ, first of all, I would like to express the, the pleasure and joy to be here at this world meeting of families. I thank God for the grace and the honor to be invited and asked to speak on the light of the family in a dark world. It is not an easy task, but in the name of the Lord, I will try my best. I will immediately start with my first point, the goodness of God's creation. God is love, and he who is infinitely perfect and blessed in, his, in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. God's creating act unfolded between two symbolic moments. The first moment is when God creates light from the formless void of the earth and the darkness of the deep. God said, let us be light. The light creates a brightness it, it enables us to act, to encounter, to know what and who is before us and to love. Darkness, on the other hand, hides and encourages evil. We cannot see where our life is going, what is good and what is evil before us. God commands light to break into the world in order to bring order out of chaos, light, light out of darkness. The second symbolic moment, the pinnacle of God's visible creation, 
concerns the human person. God says, let's make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves. What is the image and likeness that we find in the divine? At the core lies relationship. God's own word, let's make, reveals a plurality of persons, which sacred scripture shows to be the Trinity, one in nature, yet a distinction of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live in perfect unity. In this distinction and perfect unity, we find the nature of God, who is love, perfect charity. Distinction necessarily means the gift of self to the other, a relation and openness. It implies otherness. Only love, perfect charity, can create unity like this. God in his deepest mystery is not a solitude. St. John Paul II says, God is a family. He has in himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. God is love. God is like a family. Indeed, man who was created for fellowship with God and also other human beings. God made the first woman because it's not good for man to be alone. Man and women are being created as the first human family, equal in dignity complementary in relation, and each is called to make a gift of himself or herself for the other in imitation of God himself. The, relation, the relationship with God and our fellow human beings is called to reflect the very life of the Trinity distinction in perfect unity through the love that the three persons, fathers, son, and Holy, Holy Spirit, have for one another, a love whose trace we bear by being created in the divine image and likeness, a love that is fruitful, go forth and multiply. the fall from grace. The first 11 chapter of the book of Genesis want us to understand how darkness slowly seeped into, into, into the goodness of God's creation, rupturing human relationship to God, to the one another and the natural world we begin with the story of the fall. Adam and Eve broke their relationship with God by disobeying his command not to eat of the forbidden tree. They commit an act in which they say amen to the catechesis of the devil. You, you will be like gods. The heart of the devil's lie is this. God wants to limit you. He does not want to see you, your life fulfilled. So fulfill yourself as you decide best. 
Why put limits on yourself? The act of eating is a sign that Adam and Eve accept this catechesis. It is what we call the original sin. Sin generates death. Not only physical death, but ontological death too. The death of being. Man exists in so far as God gives him being, and God gives him being by loving, for God is love. If we accept through sin that God is not love, we deny that God loves us, and we separate ourselves from, from him. Our life loses its meaning. For we are, all, we are alive only in so far as God gives us our being out of love. This is confirmed when you continue reading from Genesis. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. The feeling of nakedness is the sense of this death of being, which is the absence of God. Adam and Eve experienced death, which they did not know before. For this reason, they hide from God. They begin accusing each other. Separation from God, consequently, is also a separation from one another. The first human relationship begins to disintegrate. This is what sin does. Sin leaves us weakened. Since we believe that God does not love us, we begin to seek life everywhere. Money, fame, power, and pleasure, believing that these idols will fulfill us. This is the great deception, because the more we seek life and love in these things, the more we become enslaved to them. This is the work of the, will, of the evil one. We fulfill ourselves. Our lives have meanings, and we find happiness in relating to the other, loving God and neighbor, the greatest of the commandments. But when we sin, we choose to cut ourselves from the love of God and are unable to love, pass to the other, and live a virtuous life. Even if we know the goodness of life, we choose death. This is the spiritual battle that St. Paul so poignantly describes in his letter to the Romans. The fact is, I know nothing good with living in me, in my natural self, that is. For though the will to do what is good is in me, the power to do it is not. The thing I want to do, I never do. The thing which I do not want, that is what I do. But every time 
I do what I do not want to, then it is not myself acting, but the sin that lives in me. Darkness envelops humanity. This is the condition of every man and woman. Original sin is like an uncontrollable and enveloping disease that we have inherited from our first parents. Following on from the description of the fall in Genesis 3, the subsequent chapters present the progressive fall of humanity, the scene of mankind. As a consequence of man separating himself from God, man se separates himself from man. Cain murders his younger and innocent brother, Abel. This episode introduces the bitter reality of violence and bloodshed between brothers. This violence progressively spirals out of control until the whole of humanity is totally submerged in evil, in sin, and death, signified by the wild and watery deluge of the flood to the point where humanity is walking straight toward destruction with the Tower of Babel. Its construction with its top in the heavens is a proud attempt to storm the divine through a proud field and man-made unity that is hostile to God. How sad it is that in seeing weakness, weakness on earth and how every thought in the human heart continually turned to evil, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, something that grieved him to his heart. In front of all our sufferings on a personal, family, and universal level, breakdowns in relationships, interpersonal strife, rooted in envy, anger, or hatred, moral problems from addiction to abortions, religious persecution and terrorism, if we do not go to the source, which is sin, nothing changes. Sin is the result of all our troubles, all our sufferings. According to the letter to the Hebrews, we are held in slavery for the whole of our lives through the fear that we have of death. Sin creates a deadly boundary which encircles everyone who sins. We are unable to open up to the one who goes against me. We cannot reach out and transcend ourselves in the other person. The experience of death, which possesses us, stops us loving at the moment when someone else is felt to be destroying, killing, and repressing. If this situation is not broken out of, we cannot fulfill the law of God love of God and neighbor. Here we understand the root 
of so much broken down in the God-given understanding of the family at the beginning of creation. The darkness that has entered contrary to his plan of the love and unity found in the Trinity, people even of the same sex joining themselves randomly and provisionally at, at will, cohabitation, fear of openness to life, abortion, separation and divorce, an unwillingness to care for the wicked family members, such as those who are sick or old. In vast area of a world that has forgotten God, where in the word of Pope Benedict XVI, in which the faith in many places seems like a light in danger of being snuffed off snapped out forever. Laws are passed that fuel this breaking down from those fibering, killing innocent life in the womb to a new form of union, to euthanasia and assisted suicide. Even members of the church can be tempted to soften Christ's teaching on marriage and the family and acquiesce to varying degrees. The idea that would consist in placing the magisterium in a pretty box and separating it from pastoral practice, which could The idea that would consist in placing the magisterium in a pretty box and separating it from pastoral practice, which could involve, according to circumstances, fashions, and impulses, is a form of, of heresy, a dangerous dangerous schizophrenic pathology. And this is precisely why we need Christ. Each of us need him. Every person on earth needs him. St. John, in the beginning of his gospel, reminds us all things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Repentance and kerygma. The book of Genesis is not just a story. It is our story. The story of every man and woman. So today, at this word meeting of families in Philadelphia, I extend an invitation. In this moment, enter into your heart. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the Tower of Babel, are they biblical names of a nation distant past? Or do they speak of me and my present life? Indeed, in the word of Pope Francis, when we begin to look 
at what we are capable of. And we ask ourselves, am I capable of doing this? Capable of speaking ill of another and morally killing him? I have to ask myself, am I capable of it? Yes, I am capable. Yes, I am capable of sin. I am a sinner. But God, rich in mercy, when we were dead because of our sins, he brought us to life with Christ. How beautiful are these words of St. Paul. In front of our sins, in front of the tragedy of sin, God puts a limit, intervenes with his merciful love, his Son and his Spirit. This is why repentance is good news. The acceptance of the roots of sin within our hearts is wisdom. It is the beginning of a journey of healing, the healing of man and woman, the healing of the human family, and makes us really, and makes us ready to receive the good news, to welcome the mercy of God. Yes, the mercy of God as a gift from God, as God's work in our life, a new work of creation. I believe humbly, Pope Francis says, that this is the most important good news of Christ, mercy. What a grace it is for the church and all of humanity that Pope Francis has called the Holy Year of Mercy. The joy of the gospel is the joy of mercy. This mercy has a body, has a name, Jesus Christ, who on the very same mountain where Isaac was spared, willingly carries the wood of cross and mounts that wood. Love to the end and mercy are the judgment on our sins, the free gift of Christ's passion, his cross, the, resurrec the resurrection, the ascension, and the death and descent of the Holy Spirit, a historical event that, break, that breaks into the, our existence today and the personal situation that we are facing, changing us radically. New life is possible only in so far that as a new man is coming into being, filled with the Spirit of Christ, given through the, a personal encounter with him. This is the charisma that Pope Francis speaks of on his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of, of the gospel. The charisma contains three basic elements that offer us this new life. First, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The initiative is God's. Seeing our condition, 
from the moment of original sin, God does not remain indifferent. He sent his son into the world so that we might see again what we are called to. God's will for us is that we share in his own divine nature, he who is love himself. This is what the fathers of the church refer to as admirabile commercium, the wonders exchange. In becoming incarnate, assuming a human nature to himself, God grants to us in return a participation in his otherwise inaccessible divine nature. In the word of St. Irenaeus of Lyons, Deus homo factus est ut homo fiere Deus. God became man so that man could become God. Second, Jesus' passion accomplishes this mission of offering us divine life. St. Paul tells us that death entered the world through sin. Hence, you and I are subjected to death because of our sins. Yet, we do not die since Jesus takes our place. Not only that, Jesus effects a union between God and humanity on the cross by pouring out his spirit on us when he breathes his last with words pointing to the eternal covenant of marriage, consumatum est, it is consummated. In the baptism, we too receive in our lives this same life-giving spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and raised us from the death, drawing us out of darkness, of original sin, and into God's light. For this reason, the early church called baptism for Tismos, illumination. God's indestructible life comes also to us, a life that is nurtured lifelong in the church, especially through listening to the word of God, the sacramental life, and supporting one another in a community of faith. Third, by rising from the tomb, Jesus opens the heaven for us. He carries into the bosom of the Trinity our humanity, which he knows in all of its depth, having himself descended into hell. Now in heaven, Jesus intercedes for us before the Father in all our needs. Together, Father and Son, send into our hearts the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Love to the end, the sign of faith. This Spirit, the Holy Spirit, agent of charity, love to the end, is the gift offered to us to face and overcome all that seems humanly impossible within the family and the old relationship. Openness to life, faithfulness in a marriage, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, 
in sickness and in health, care for the sick, care for sick and disabled, remaining close to our elderly, forgiving the one who injures. This is the love revealed and freely given by Jesus in his passion. Caritas, a sacrificial, self-giving love that makes a person go out of himself to love God and neighbor to the end. By rising from the dead, Jesus Christ has broken the circle of sin and death, which keeps us enslaved and close off the path to love the other. So thus freed, we can pass through the barrier which separates us from the other and love them. It is a love to, to the end, love in the dimension of, of the cross, love to the enemy. This is the light that overcomes every darkness in family life, so often overladen in this world with division, pain, and the cross. To love the other when he or she is different to me means to overcome death. We pass from death to life through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not moralism. God's grace comes before one's duty. We reply to a divine initiative. All those wounded by personal sin and the sin of others, the divorced and separated, those who have cohabited, who lived close in on themselves or in all kinds of self-seeking unions can and must find in the church a place for regeneration without any finger being pointed, pointed at them. This is the testimony that the Christian family is called to give. Love to the end is possible. Jesus told his disciples that others would come to know him through a concrete sign. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this love you have for one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. The family and every Christian is called to make such love to the end visible. Thus calling others to believe. In the early church, no believers were called to faith by the witness of the first Christians, even into death, see how they love one another. This love is stronger than any darkness. As Jesus in the Eucharistic sacrifice to be given out, poured out for the other through the grace of the risen spirit of Christ, who overcomes every kind of barrier. The Christian family, wellspring of faith, hope, and love. The family then becomes the first evangelizer. By its vocation, Pope Francis writes, the family is meant to spread to spread its love to the world around it. 
The family is the wellspring of faith. Faith needs a place where it is gestated, transmitted, where it can grow, where it can become a lived experience. From the start of creation, God chose the family as this place. He created the family as the place that would speak of God, that would praise God of his fullness, fruit, fruit, fruitfulness, Adam and Eve, of forgiveness and brotherhood, Cain and Abel, of salvation of form sin, the family of Noah, of faith, Abraham and Sarah. In the family, the promises of God become real. The family is a living memory of the fidelity of God. The family is the wellspring of hope. The family directs itself and looks always towards the future. The family carries in itself the future. It is custodian of our future, the future of humanity. Within a, within a family, parents are custodians of children. And in time, children will become custodians of their aging and sick parents and grandparents. The future needs not, do, not look bleak, for in the family, hope in the future is built, becoming also a sign for the rise of humanity. The family is the wellspring of love. Perfect love or charity is relationship as we see in the very life of God. Three distinct persons who live in perfect unity. The family is called to live this mission as relationship. Husband and wife, parents and children, grandparents. In the family, we learn to relate, to love, to serve one another. We become like God through relationship of self-giving love. Marriage, openness to life, defending the dignity of life from the first moment of conception to its natural end, care for the, for the weak and elderly, the family becomes the place where solitude, selfishness, egoism find healing, where we become decentered person and another becomes the center of my life. Living examples. The world today needs saints with heroic witness to defend and nurture the family. By opening ourselves to God's grace, his Holy Spirit living in us, our homes and families can allow goodness to enter the world. Allow me to finish my address with a moving yet beautiful example of how the witness of the Christian family can bring light to even the greatest of darkness. It concerned September 11, 2001, the day of the Twin Towers massacre in New York and the true story of a family in the United States. Frank Palombo, his wife Jean, and their 10 children. The youngest, Maggie, who was just one at the time, 
and the eldest, Anthony, 15 years of age. A very Catholic family for sure. In an interview, Jean recounts how she woke up worried that morning because she thought that she was pregnant. I told Frank, I cannot gain so soon. I'll go crazy. Frank answered me, do not worry about that. But what will we call him? I start to laugh. He always knew how to make me laugh. Frank never returned home that September 11 in 2001. He was a New York firefighter who alongside almost 3,000 other victims gave his life in the terrorist attack. In an interview given less than two months after 9-11, Jean recognizes that their marriage and family life was not always idyllic. 70 years, 70 years ago, I had left the church I did not want any children. My marriage was breaking up little by little. But then, through a missionary outreach in their parish in New York, something changed. I witnessed Christianity in a missionary couple who were expecting their fourth child. They had left everything, home, careers, country, to proclaim the gospel. I thought, God loves me so much that he has inspired in, some, in someone this desire so that I could hear the gospel, the good news. Asked, asked about the, her feelings after the twin Tower's tragedy, Jean said, I miss Frank terribly and I cry a lot, but I know that he will continue to help us from heaven. She added, I think that God works for the good of those who love him. This event has been a great evil, but God's love has exceeded this evil. Frank transmitted faith to the children, and they often console me with a word. When I think of the terrorists, I can only say, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they have done. Sure, I am afraid, but I cling to the, to the Lord. My children and I need to continue in the church doing God's will. Five years ago, at the age of just 49, Jean, already a young widow with 10 children, was diagnosed with cancer. Jean died a little over two years ago. Her eight sons carried her coffin into the Cathedral Basilica of the Sacred Heart in New York, New Jersey, before 2,000 people and some 30 priests. Maggie, 
now 15, was asked by a neighbor why she seemed so much at peace. And she answered, because my mom is in heaven. I know she has complete joy. What more could I want for her? Maggie's many brothers and sister are taking care of her today. Thank God for large families. Anthony, the eldest son, and now 29, served at the funeral mass. He the father's self-giving witness as the father of 10 children, a firefighter, but most of all, a man of faith, surely inspired Anthony to enter the seminary. In the coming year, Anthony will be ordained a priest. This is the story of a reversal. Evil does not have the last word. God brings good from evil. This is how God has worked from the beginning of creation. God is not overcome by evil. He overcomes evil with good. In the face of all the challenges of married and family life, Frank and Jean Palombo, a young married husband and wife in the United States, were granted the grace to love selflessly to the end, first by repenting, then receiving and believing in the kerygma, the good news. The faith with which they lived and their children still live instills hope in us that we too can bring the light of the gospel into our world, putting flesh on the words of St. Paul. May you be strengthened with power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. May Jesus Christ be praised. Amen.